Uh, my name is Kai Wen. I'm a software engineer from Open Government Products and the talk today is React Native X Parking.sg. It's been a long day so I'll try and make it uh, more snappy and yeah. So uh, without further ado, here I go. Uh, contents for today is first a brief introduction on what React Native is. Next I'll be talking about our experience with React Native, its pros, which I'll just go through really quickly and then some of the more interesting cons or stuff we didn't expect when we use React Native. And then we'll talk about Hot Code Push, which is an incredible feature that we are using. And it really makes uh, developer life uh, much better and it's great for users as well. Fourth, I'll be going through what you need to do to write a native module in React Native. And lastly, I'll have a Q&A where you can ask me any question about the talk itself or just anything in general. Hopefully at the end of this talk, uh, you have a better idea on what React Native can offer, what it doesn't offer, and uh, it will help you uh, decide whether React Native is something you want to use in your next project or you want to add it, add it to your current project. Uh, first thing, uh, React Native. What React Native is, first, it's a framework that you can use to build native mobile applications by writing JavaScript and React. First announced at Facebook's Affect conference in 2015 March. Yeah, you can really write native mobile apps. It's not a web view. It's not a wrapper for a website. And you do that by using React Native components. Its components actually call underlying iOS and Android APIs. For example, in React Native, when you make use of the view component, it will render a UI view in iOS. And for Android, it will render a view. Right. So here's our experience in using React Native. Uh, some background, background on why we are using React Native. Uh, Parking.sg is the application that we launched in October, I think, uh, 2017. And uh, the first prototype began in September 2016. At that time, we were thinking of what technology to use. And we were making a prototype so we could go down to government agencies to, to pitch to them this concept of digital parking, where you can park your car without using, park, without using parking coupons and just pay using your smartphone. So we had some options. We were thinking, should we use Ionic? Which our team did have some familiarity because our team also made an application called Beeline. It's a crowdsource uh, bus service where you, you get the crowd to kind of uh, contribute to a viable bus route. And if it's viable, it will be launched. So another option was going full native, but that was too much of an overkill because you would have to have two separate code bases for iOS and Android, too much for a prototype. And finally, there was a new kit on the block called React Native, and it was also gaining community traction. And that's what we went if we tried React Native. And moreover, uh, Facebook used it for their own app. So if Facebook could make a well-functioning app, there wouldn't be too much of a risk. Yeah. So pros in using React Native. First, it's in JavaScript. And JavaScript is the top most used programming language in the world today. So it's great. You're more likely to find a library that you can and a question would be more likely answered. Don't have to be an expert to get started in iOS and Android. And it's also a great benefit if you're using Node.js for your service because with that, your front-end and back-end engineer can work much more closely together. Uh, in fact, we actually review each other's code, which you don't get so often if you're using a different language. So uh, with much closer integration, you can also have a reusable code that is same code for both your front-end and your back-end. Uh, another pro would be that uh, there's a high percentage of code we use for two platforms, iOS and Android. For us, we have an estimation of about 90%, uh, maybe even more. So uh, sometimes you do need to have some platform-specific code, uh, such as this. So if it's an iOS, you've got to have a different offset if it's an iPhone X, something like that. But anyway, you get uh, much less code to maintain for two platforms, so that's a big win. Uh, another pro that we'll talk about is hot code push, which I'll be covering later. Cons, things or things we didn't realize so much when we started. Uh, not all node packages work. So when you use React Native, you make use of uh, NPM, your node package manager, but you quickly realize that uh, not all of them work because React Native does not actually run in a node or browser runtime environment. Um, so we use a tool called Stripe. Stripe is a payment provider. Uh, it's a great uh, tool that you can, uh, or a great service which you can use to collect payments. They make collecting money easy. 
So they have lots of awesome tools that work out of the box when you use Stripe for, let's say, web development. Uh, you can just use the Stripe checkout, a Stripe, Stripe checkout, and you straight away get a checkout box where someone can key in its credit card, and it does some magic where it checks whether the card is correct, whether it's a MasterCard, whether it's a Visa, and you also have the Stripe SDK where you can use to call their methods instead of calling uh, API directly. You can use their SDK. But all these things actually don't work on React Native, which was something that we did not expect when we went with it. Uh, because React Native, uh, because for the Stripe SDK, it depends on the node dependency called HTTP, and it's not present inside React Native, because React Native is basically a native application. And that means that you are going to have a high reliance on community packages, and they are sometimes a hit or miss. So uh, one of the packages that I tried to use uh, is Axios, quite a popular HTTP client for uh, browser and Node.js, and it's a great library to use, and I tried to use it. So, because the default uh, client on React Native is called Fetch. Fetch is quite low level, quite hard to use, so I tried to use Axios, right? So I searched up the NPM repository, and I found two packages, uh, React Native Axios, and second package is called Axios. So, I was thinking, um, well, not everything works, so which one did I go with? Well, I went for React Native Axios because, well, you, you wrote it for React Native, right? Should work better. But it turned out to be a bit of a dud. <laughs> what happened was that I met with a, a bug where it was supposed to throw me an error, but it just stayed silent. And I couldn't figure out what was the problem. And then my colleague suggested that, why don't you try the original library? And fine, okay, then I, I switched it out and I used the original library, Axios, and then it worked fine without a hiccup. So sometimes uh, when you use when you use React Native, when you're looking for a package to use, it's a little bit of a hit of a miss. You gotta kind of figure out which ones to trust, and you you gotta do some trial and error because uh, um, sometimes people don't state explicitly that they support React Native. Uh, cons: another con would be not everything works as seamlessly as you expect in React Native. So there were differences in UI that you don't expect sometimes. So sometimes you have a text. Uh, that is supposed to look this way, but on iOS. And you realize that on Android, it looks slightly different. Maybe it's uh, like a few pixels higher or a few pixels lower. So this is a closed issue on uh, Facebook's React Native page. Uh, line height behaves differently on iOS and Android. So basically, sometimes you have problems where things look slightly different, and you have to Google why is it like that, and you realize that, oh, there's an existing bug. So you have to Google for workarounds to find out what are the problems and search for uh, solutions to the problem you are facing. One of the worst problems I face when using React Native for parking.sg is this. So this is a Stack Overflow question that I posted two years, three months ago. And I took this screenshot maybe a few days ago. And uh, today, it's still getting some upvotes. means uh, it's still an active question that's helping people. So it says here, React Native Xcode project product archive fails with duplicate symbols for architecture ARM64. This was a memorable day because on this day I was in office and trying to deploy the first version for parking.sg onto the iTunes Connect and I just couldn't figure out why the iOS project failed to archive. And I just worked on the problem for hours and hours until I think it was close midnight. Couldn't find a solution, couldn't Google for a solution and that's why I posted this question on Stack Overflow. After some time I did manage to find out how to do it and then afterwards, I answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, here you go. You have to Google for workarounds. And finally, the last con. Uh, you do need to care for native when you use React Native. Uh, and this would, might be a bit of a turn, turn off for some people if you're coming from a, a more web development and you're familiar with React and you're going to React Native. You have to care about native because if you're using React Native, you're probably interested in some of the closer native integrations such as uh, better access to your OS level push notifications, location access. And when you do all these, when you are deploying your application, you have to deal with stuff such as iOS certificate management, provisioning profiles, and you have to deal with uh, different permission models for iOS and Android. Some permissions are considered unsafe on Android. Some are considered, even if it's the same permission, it might be considered safe on iOS. So you have to care for these things when you are using React Native. And uh, other, another thing would be you have to conform to new requirements and API changes as well. So this is an issue that I closed on our GitHub page for our project. Android must target API level 26 for updates by 1st November 2018. Something else you have to consider when you're going for React Native because uh, you have to go comply with Play Store, App Store stuff. 
So if you don't comply by API level, you cannot uh, make another update to the Play Store. Yeah, that's what it means. And uh, finally, hot code push, which I skipped earlier. I dedicated a portion for hot code push is because it's such an incredible feature that we enjoy. And after using it uh, in our first React Native project, every time we start a new project, let's say if we are using React Native, the first thing that we think we should add before pushing the app into users' hands is hot code push. So what is it? It's uh, this package, React Native code push that we use. Uh, the core maintainers is Microsoft. And hot code push for React Native allows you to update your app without going through the Play Store and App Store. Uh, this is roughly how it works. So when you upload your app into the store, it's the one on the left, a React Native app, you have a certain native code version. So like this is a binary version, v2, blah, blah, blah. And then inside that code, there's also a JavaScript bundle, which is your React Native application JavaScript logic. And then uh, when the app starts up, it talks to a code push server. And the code push server will tell it whether there is a later JavaScript bundle for this binary version. If there is, it will push it down to the application. And then, ta-da, it will replace it. And you've updated your app. Um, this includes logic and view, because in React Native, you control your logic and view mainly using JavaScript. So it's great, because it lowers your friction for app updates. And this is what I need to do for making an update if I want to use Hot Kapush. Just two lines of, just two lines in my command line, and I'm done. Instead of having to package it and uh, package on iOS, on the Xcode, or on Android Studio, two lines, and this is done. The first line is to say, uh, code push, uh, release my app name, platform Android, with a certain description, and uh, mandatory update, and targeting a certain binary version. The second line would just be to set it to production, uh, because the code push has, uh, you can have, two, you can have two, uh, two parts for code push, one for your staging application, and one for production. So two lines of code, and your update is live to your users. You push right into their phones without them having to do anything. Once they open up the app, it's updated. Uh, this is the stats for us. Uh, Parking.sg, we have released about 126 versions, but the total number of Play Store versions is just 22. And in between, they are all Hot Code Push versions. So this is kind of what it looks like in uh, the repository. Uh, take a look. Some of them have a tag called uh, Android binary, iOS binary, and those are the ones that we actually uh, upload to the Play Store app store. All the rest are just hot code push versions. This is really fantastic because it allows you to make really small, quick updates to users and allows quick bug fixes. From the moment I receive uh, a bug report, I receive a bug report, which we handle our tickets using Zendesk. And then uh, once I read it and we figure out what's going on, uh, after I make the code change, I run the two lines of code and the updated app is in the user's hands. As quickly as that, you can, and then we straight away reply to the user. Just open the app, it's fixed. You don't even have to say, uh, go and update your app, and etc. It's great. Uh, much reduced lag from code to users' hands. And you, you just get better quality of life for your developers and for users. So uh, finally, I would like to talk about the last point, uh, which is writing a native module. Uh, writing a native module is actually not that difficult in React Native. And the first native module that I have to write for our project was uh, because we had to lower the, we had to, uh, lower the PCI requirement that, uh, we were at, that we needed to fulfill for using uh, Stripe. Because Stripe has a payment processor, they, they need you to be PCI compliant. And the way you use their services affects the compliance level that, or, or the requirements that you need to hit to be PCI compliant. If you were to use their API service directly, they will require you to have a higher level of requirement, which was what we did initially. We just called the API directly. We send the card numbers to them directly using HTTPS. Uh, this requires a higher level of PCI compliant uh, requirements. But instead, if you use their SDK, so they have Stripe has mobile SDK for Android, iOS. If you use their SDK, and you, uh, it's a much lower requirement to be PCI compliant. So that's what we did. And I'm just going to walk through uh, kind of what you need to do to write a native module in Android. So here's an Android project. Uh, screen is a little hard to see. Uh, Android project, and this is kind of, uh, and the module that I'm writing is called Light Stripe because I just needed one method from uh, the Stripe SDK. So uh, first, I'll look at, uh, you need to write a, a module called uh, Light Stripe Module Java 
and that's what I wrote. In this file, um, you need to basically a native module over here is a Java class that extends the React context-based Java module, which is this. Uh, so we'll just declare this is a class that extends this React context-based Java module. And uh, React context-based Java module requires a method called getName, which is uh, what is implemented over here. GetName returns uh, you a React class, and the React class, I've put it as Lightstripe. So basically, uh, this provides the JavaScript context with the name of the module. The name of the module is Lightstripe. Next, you can do the actual implementation of the, of the code, of the native code. And this actual implementation, I call it uh, create token with card and publishable key. And take note, you have to annotate React method. When you annotate React method, what it does is that it exposes this method to your JavaScript context when you uh, use it in React Native. And there are a few arguments here. First is readable map. Second is a string, which is a publishable key. Third is a promise. When you actually make the last argument a promise, what happens when you call uh, this method in JavaScript is that you'll get back a promise. So you can wait for that promise in JavaScript. So let's take a look at what uh, the mapping is. A readable map, a readable map uh, in Java will actually be a JavaScript object. So, when you, so in JavaScript, when we call this method, you pass an object, and it will be a readable map here in Java. So the first one is a card, which you pass in an object in JavaScript. Second is just a string. A string maps to, maps to a string. So on the left is Java. On the right is JavaScript. So let's take a look at what this method does. Create token with card and publishable key. What I'm trying to do is to use the Stripe mobile SDK for Java and using one method called the create token. And when the create token, uh, create token takes in a Stripe card, which is basically credit card details that uh, the user keys in. And then you pass the credit card details into this Stripe SDK method called create token, and you get back a token. And then uh, you receive the reply using the promise. Uh, whether it's successful, you resolve it. If there's an error, you reject it. And this will be received by your JavaScript React Native code. Uh, since you're done with that, the last thing you need to do is to register the module to make it available in React Native. Uh, there's another file which was created called lightstrappackage.java. You have to register it. This lightstrappackage.java implements a React package. Next, uh, in create, create native module is the one that actually creates and registers it. And in this method, you simply return the module that, we, that I showed you earlier. Return the lightstrap module. Finally, uh, you have to have registered one more place called the main application.java. This file is present in every React Native project. So inside main application.java, there's a list of packages that uh, it's actually making available into your React Native context. So over here is all the native integrations. The first one, main React package, is just the main React library. So uh, Lightstripe package is the one that we just created. So put it here, and it'll be available inside your React Native code. <laughs> So the last thing you need to do is to make it available in your JavaScript. So over here is the JavaScript code, uh, React Native code. You just simply access that native module by importing native modules from React Native. And then you can reference the name of the module in native modules. And since it's called Lightstripe, yep, export Lightstripe. And then you can use it, lightstripe.createToken with card and publishable key, which is the method you saw earlier just now. So there we go. Uh, it's not too difficult to create, a React, uh, to create a native module in React Native. If you would like more references, take a look at the following stuff. A um, uh, YouTube video by Peggy Raises on how to bridge native modules and UI components. It's, uh, the video is quite detailed and goes through step by step in detail. And uh, it's probably quite useful. Some of the stuff is a little bit outdated, but the concepts are there. Uh, of course, refer to the official native docs for updated documentation. <laughs> Finally, uh, this is the end. And ask me any questions you like. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, so the question was that uh, was that uh, why, if Hawker Push is so good, why are we still making updates on the App Store and Play Store? I'm going to refer to an earlier slide to answer that. So uh, if you look at the slides, uh, in a React Native app, there is a native code and there's a JavaScript code. So it could happen uh, that 
sorry, uh, let me rephrase the answer. So it means that uh, when you actually use hot code push, the only thing you are replacing is the JavaScript bundle. Yeah, only the JavaScript bundle is available for you to update using hot code push. You cannot update any uh, native application code using hot code push, which means that if you, you could potentially uh, push, uh, let's say if I write, if I make some native integrations and then I change some JavaScript code and then without updating the App Store and Play Store and I just straight away upload uh, this new version of uh, hot code push bundle, what happens is that uh, if I push it to the app that does not have the native changes, that JavaScript code will, cache, will crash because it doesn't have the native bindings. Yeah, only native, uh, native code can only be updated through the App Store and Play Store. Yeah. Since your application is a uh, government-related uh, application, right? So uh, is there a concern to post your bundle on some uh, server? Okay, okay. Uh, question is that since uh, application is uh, government-related, is it uh, okay for us to host our code on a server? Uh, well, the answer to that is yes, because uh, there is no secrets in the front-end code. Yeah, absolutely no secrets. And in fact, we do plan on making uh, parking.sg open sourced. Yeah. Any other questions? You can ask me anything about the talk or just uh, anything in general about parking.sg or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, what I can think about that, uh, for example, if you're uh, deploying one update via Play Store, just to say, and another update via just JS bundle. So there will be some version mismatch. Or how do you overall manage that uh, both the versions so that at the end of the day, when you do the next Play Store update, it is sent and it's not uh, running. Play Store is running ahead and JS bundle is running behind. How do you? Uh, I'm, I'm more interested in knowing the versioning of. Okay, uh, so I, I guess the question is more about uh, how do we manage versioning since we have uh, two streams, like uh, one is hot code push and one is uh, through the App Store, Play Store. And again, I'll re go and refer to one of the slides, uh, this slide. So uh, actually two slides, I'll, I'll go to the one before. So if you, if you look at how I actually make a code push update, the first command that I call uh, over here towards the last line, it says target the binary version. So when you actually make a code push, you can actually say this hot code push bundle is only supposed to be installed on a certain target binary version. So that's kind of how we, we manage uh, whether a bundle should be pushed into a certain binary. So uh, how we do it is, is kind of through this. So, uh, so I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with this view. So these are just texts that we use in our GitHub repository. And every time, uh, so the, the, the version right on top, so uh, v218.2 is a hot code push bundle. Uh, and it's only pushed into binary versions v2180, both iOS binary and Android binary. So any hot code push versions for us, that is uh, v218, will be pushed only into binary versions uh, v218, as you see there, iOS binary, Android binary. We don't push it to like earlier. So uh, everything on top consists of uh, everything below. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Do, you have any, do you have any problems with Apple regarding code push because they are very strict regarding yeah. Yeah, uh, question is, do we have any problems with Apple for hot code, using hot code push? So far, we have not received any problems. And um, I think the Microsoft React Native hot code push was not the only one that tried to do some uh, fancy stuff like that, where you can update uh, away from the uh, App Store or Play Store. And so far, there has been uh, no problems. And I think the main reason is because of the limitation that you see over here. Because there is no way that you can make a JavaScript update uh, that, that actually uses some native feature that did not exist if you don't go through the Play Store and App Store. So if you were going to make a certain binary or native change that, that, that requires a more dangerous permission uh, and it requires a binary change, you'd have to go through the App Store. So I guess this is one of the reasons why React Native Hot Code Push is still alive today. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they do have some uh, clauses that 
you are not allowed to change the main, uh, like main goal of your application. So right now it's a parking app. I cannot change it into a gambling app using <laughs> JavaScript. Yeah. So if you do that, they'll take it off the App Store. Yeah. I was wondering how long it takes to download a new JS bundle v Does it like cause slowness when you boot up the app? Like, like do you, can you not, does the app wait for you to get a new bundle before you open the app? And does it, is that a concern? The uh, question was that, uh, is, there, is it a concern um, when a new JavaScript bundle is being downloaded? Does it cause lag? Uh, yeah, um, from what we have observed, not really. So how, how it looks like is when you open up the app, app loads, and then uh, because I'm using a mode called mandatory update, there are a few modes you can use for the hot code push uh, library. You can actually have a pop-up that says there is a new version, or, and you can also upload a new version and you say that the, and the, you can say that that version is not mandatory. Uh, so there are multiple ways to do it. For us, we set, always set it as mandatory and the speed is really fast. Once you open up the app, I think within half a second, it flashes like white and then it just loads the new JavaScript bundle instantly. So no, and we have not really, I don't think we've received any feedback that uh, uh, about about any problems with that, yeah. So it's really fast. Yeah. yeah. So usually the React Native application would size larger in these. Uh, I'm not sure about every situation. Because my mind, the API size is very much bigger for React. So you can you measure to reduce the or it's okay. Uh, I didn't really catch what you said. Could you s uh, say a bit slower? Uh, what compared to Android? Yeah. I see. I see. Uh, so you're asking if it's if there's a big difference in size or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question was whether a React Native application is much bigger in size than a native application. I I don't have I don't have a model answer, but just what I've realized. Uh, I don't think there is a huge difference, and because basically in your application the stuff that takes up the most space are your assets. So uh, whether it's a native application or React native applications, if you bundle in lots of assets, pictures or whatever, it'll be huge. Otherwise, it's pretty small. For Parking.sg, I think uh, both apps are around 10 megabytes or so, and uh, probably the main improvements would be if you actually take advantage of. Uh, let's say the uh, new, new bundling methods provided by Android or new bundling methods provided by iOS. Yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Right, okay, if there are no more questions, uh, just a, a, quick, a quick one. Uh, last slide that I didn't show would be, we're hiring. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, go check out our website, open.gov.sg, about 20 plus of us, about pro uh, mainly product managers, software engineers, and UX designers. Uh, we do stuff for public good, identify areas, and we work proactively. So check out our websites and uh, apply if you want. Thank you. <laughs>